afternoon. Happy National Preservation Month and welcome to our virtual gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, a statewide membership based historic preservation organization. My name is Beverly Thomas and on behalf of the Preservation Alliance, I'm pleased to be welcoming you to an overview of New Hampshire architecture with Laura Black. We are now in our third month of Old House and Barn Expo on the road, our COVID safe replacement of our postponed 2020 Expo. We'll be offering these virtual sessions throughout the year and hope to include some in-person events in the fall as well. We love getting you and other Old House and Barn owners and preservation advocates together to share practical information from highly qualified presenters, make connection and offer you a dose of energy and inspiration too. A few housekeeping points I'd like to mention before we get started. Um, I'd like to remind you we are recording today's session, so please stay muted to keep the background noise to a minimum. You may also want to spotlight the speaker during the presentation by choosing the side-by-side -side speaker option in the upper uh, right-hand side of your screen under view feature. Today's presentation will run about 45 minutes and will be followed by 15 minute Q&A. I'll wrap up the program at one o'clock, but Laura has agreed to stay on for an additional 15 minutes for those who would like to continue the discussion. And because of our high numbers today, I encourage you to use the chat function for your questions at the bottom of the screen, um, and we will address them in the Q&A at the end. And before we close, we'll be selecting our lucky winner of our Expo Door Prize. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. You, many of you may know Laura Black as she has been with the New Hampshire Division of Historic Resources for over a decade with roles ranging from project director for a variety of DHR's more unique projects to above ground compliance reviewer for transportation projects and to coordinator of DHR's easement program. Her career has included work in both public history and cultural resource management. So I am pleased to turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Beverly and New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. Um, the DHR is really pleased to participate in this program and it's great that we're able to do this in a virtual way during this very unusual year. Um, this is an overview of New Hampshire architecture and we will be focusing primarily on residential architecture today, but a lot that, um, that we talk about today will definitely um, uh, transfer over to other types of buildings in the state. Um, so I'll just uh, jump right on in here. Um, New Hampshire really has a rich history and learning how to um, read buildings can really help you understand what that, that history is. Uh, so um, my interest in historic preservation and architectural history actually started with that concept. The idea that, that you can use buildings and uh, landscapes and the things that, that people leave be, be behind them um, in order to understand uh, historical trends and events and um, themes from, from the, the, the past. I just found that to be really fascinating. Um, and that's how I um, eventually got in, into this field. So um, the, the content of um, the program today, I'll just kind of um, provide a little bit of a, of a start off. Uh, it's going to start with um, an, uh, an overview of how to look at details of buildings to help identify style. Uh, then uh, we'll go into uh, looking at a variety of architectural styles that you might find in New Hampshire, um, as well as some um, forms and um, plans of buildings that may not actually have a style but can still be read on the landscape. Um, and, and then um, at the end, I'll provide um, a number of resources uh, that you can use um, if you're interested in investigating a little bit more about architecture in New Hampshire and, um, and maybe trying out some reading of those, of those buildings. First, I'm just going to um, give a little bit of background uh, about the Division of Historical Resources. We are, if you're not familiar, the New Hampshire State Historic Preservation Office, and we are involved in a lot of different types of programs um, for the, the state. Um, we administer a number of federal programs, such as the National Register of Historic Places and the Preservation Tax Credit Program. 
We also uh, administer a number of honorary programs like the um, historical highway marker program and the state register to start places. Uh, and um, we've got some public outreach and education programs such as um, the State Conservation and Rescue Archaeology Program or SCRAP, uh, and then also Project Archaeology for the younger folks interested in archaeology. And then, of course, we work with federal, state, and our local partners in our review and compliance program. So, um, <clears throat> all right. Um, so New Hampshire is really lucky to have uh, some early examples of architecture still existing in the state, um, such as the Richard Jackson House in Portsmouth, uh, which is recorded as the oldest wood frame house in the state built in 1664. But really the, the breadth of architectural styles in the state ranges from the 18th century all the way to the present. And an interesting fact, um, according to the US Census American Community Survey, um, there are more than 614,000 housing units in New Hampshire, and more than one third of those were built before 1970, and almost half of those were built before 1939. So what are we talking about when we're talking about reading a, a building? Uh, we certainly don't have to have the opportunity to go inside a building and investigate the construction methods. Uh, we, uh, we, we can actually work with what we see from the exterior building. Um, that, that, that's fine. We can learn a lot um, just from walking around the out, outside. And um, what we're doing is we're looking at particular details, um, features that, that are, are common to specific styles. Um, and those styles will help you, um, uh, understanding what the style is will then lead you to a particular period um, and a, a con construction period. And then understanding um, both of those um, will, uh, will help you understand um, what, what that historical context in that community, in that um, household might, might be. So one of the first things that you might want to look at is these large scale features, um, such as roof forms. So you certainly have some uh, simple roof forms, like here we've got the side gable and the front gable uh, roof forms, fairly straightforward. There are the flat roof forms, you might find those more often on commercial buildings or industrial buildings. Um, there's, uh, you know, um, roof forms that are a bit more, um, a, a bit more com com complex than the gable, uh, such as the gambrel there. Um, oftentimes, uh, the gambrel is um, sort of identified, uh, you know, commonly with, with a barn, perhaps. Um, but the gambrel roof is actually um, something that, that can very much uh, define an architectural style. Um, then you have the hipped roof um, and the asymmetrical, um, of which the, the salt box there. Um, and then not shown on this particular slide, but we'll see later, are the really co co complex roof lines, which um, definitely uh, clue, clue you in that it's, it's not one of these, um, these styles, it's, it's uh, um, other styles like a Queen Anne perhaps or an Italianate, and we'll see that a little bit later. Another large scale feature uh, that can help you uh, read a building is the balance on the elevation, um, whether it's a symmetrical uh, fa fa facade that we see on the left here, um, or an asymmetrical like we see on the right, um, and these are two basic examples, um, but, but this is also a concept, um, the um, the sym symmetry or asymmetry on a building um, is definitely common to certain types of architectural styles. Then we get into some small scale features like windows, doors, porches. Um, for example, windows, um, the, the, the both from a technological perspective and also an aesthetic per per perspective reflect certain styles. 
and, and construction periods. So you would have um, uh, smaller panes, more um, panes in windows from architectural styles that are um, early, earlier on. Uh, and then as you move through time, you get larger and larger panes and, um, and less numbers of them. Um, you also would see uh, mutton um, uh, shapes um, pro or pro profiles change through, through time, and those can provide clues to the um, architectural style as well. Um, some other um, things that, that you can uh, identify from windows would be uh, styles of windows, aesthetic of windows that are really, really common to very specific styles. Like a Queen Anne, um, one of the Queen Anne architecture uh, window styles is small panes around a larger pane of, 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 of glass. Um, materials are another thing that, that can be used to read a building, although um, these are not as reliable as some other features because they certainly weather more and are more re replaceable. So um, you can, um, they, they might be original or they might re re represent um, different uh, rehabilitation camp camp campaigns. Or they might represent a particular time frame that the aluminum salesman went, went through a particular town. We have certainly seen, seen that. Um, so things like, like siding, um, roof ma ma materials, foundations um, can certainly uh, give you a bit of a hint in terms of when a foundation or a house might have been built um, based on the um, the quarrying methods um, if you have a stone foundation. Some other decorative details as we get smaller in a building that, that you might want to look at to help identify your architectural style. Um, certainly root, um, rather uh, por porches um, provide a lot of clues to which style it is. Um, decorative features in the actual construction or the, the build, the, um, like in the center there, you have the decorative um, coining. Uh, you've got some Italianate brackets in the cornice over on the left hand side. And then these are a number of different types of um, architectural dormers or uh, roof dormers that, that um, show up on particular styles of, of building. So once you sort of know what you're looking for and how to piece it together, um, you can really uh, learn how to read a building. So now we're going to move into um, the architectural styles um, that we might find in New Hampshire. And this certainly is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are other styles out there. There are other styles that you might find in New Hampshire too. Um, but we're gonna go through a number of them and we're gonna do it chronologically. Um, this first first one, um, so uh, before we, we, I go into the styles, I did wanna mention that the first period that we're gonna talk about is the colonial period. And this is one of those time frames that a lot of particular real estate um, agents might refer to the colonial style. There isn't actually a colonial style, it's the colonial period. And there are architectural styles that were particularly popular within that particular time period. And we'll see this pop up in another time as well. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the Georgian style. <clears throat> and this is the Moffat Lad House in Portsmouth. And um, these, uh, the colonial period um, styles were typically were um, de de designs that were brought um, from the, f by, by builders, by, by builders with a familiarity um, coming from England. So these are, um, there are features and design um, elements that would have been familiar to the colonists um, from where they had uh, come, come from. So um, there, it was also um, this particular time period uh, was a lot less flexible than we might get into um, in later periods. 
the Georgian style had, um, you know, there's certainly variants in, in houses, um, but um, the characteristics were very much um, to this style. So you might see um, roof balustrade, uh, the, um, the dentals along the, the cornice. Um, one variant um, that was particularly um, popular or you might find in the northern colonies are these windows that pretty much touch the, the cornice line. Um, if here is another example of this decorative corner coins um, and there's certainly symmetry in this um, in this building. Federal style coming a little bit later. Um, what really characterizes the federal style is that it's a much lighter, it's a more delicate version of, of architecture than the previous Georgian. Uh, for example, on the windows, you still have a lot of multi pane windows, small pane windows, but the muttons um, that are dividing the, the sash are um, much, much, much narrower and much more delicate. So unlike um, the previous colonial period where the architecture was heavily influenced by what early colonists were familiar with, the Romantic period um, and the architectural styles uh, popular within it were really evocative of Greek democracy and were thought to be particularly appropriate to a new re republic. And these styles also rejected traditional ties to England after the War of 1812. So you see during this period uh, more of a break from um, English tra traditions. Um, also during this time period, you have an um, increased use of pattern books. There were certainly pattern books in the earlier period, but during this time, um, pattern books were used with a lot more flexibility. So people could actually choose elements from different house styles, and you see a lot more transitional um, architectural um, style. So the Greek Revival, Um, this is a fully realized example of a Greek Revival House, and this is the Margaret Porter House in Walpole. And um, most examples in New Hampshire that you probably see feature are, are, are Greek Revival details applied to more common um, house types, like the Kate perhaps. Um, but uh, if you look at, at, at this house, this fully realized house, um, you'll see a number of different um, architectural elements that were very um, uh, particular to Greek re re revival. Um, uh, certainly the, um, the very prominent um, cor uh, uh, cornice re 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 returns, um, gable front, it's very temple-like. Um, you have uh, cornice lines emphasized with a wide divided band of tram. Um, you have uh, the, uh, um, the doors with the thin line of the side lights and transom um, and, and, and these other uh, fe fe features. It certainly has a particular uh, feel to, to the, the building. The Gothic Revival style. Um, this one was championed, particularly in pattern books, by um, Alexander Jackson Davis and Andrew Jackson Downing in the 1830s and 1840s. And what was particularly um, interesting uh, and, and, and critical to, to this style was that it was really the first time that, um, that architecture and landscape were really connected. This was definitely emphasized as a rural house type, a picturesque house type. It was not really um, recommended or, or emphasized to be on urban, um, in an urban land landscape. There was really a, a connection between house and, and grounds with the Gothic revival style. And here you start to see, um, uh, you've got the deep, uh, steeply pitched roofs, um, often with a decorated verge board here. Um, you've got introduction of some bay windows, um, pattern slate, slate roof, um, the um, arched or uh, the pointed arch window, which you don't see in this photo, but that's um, 
that, that, that graphic um, detail. Italianate, <clears throat> we're also, um, it's also a style that was popularized by the pattern books of Andrew Jackson Downing. And um, the, it's, uh, it's one of those styles that I have found even before I got into architectural history to be a very identifiable architectural style. Um, you might have um, some uh, multi-story towers, um, the, the um, decorative um, uh, cornice brackets that are eave brackets that, um, that we saw earlier on. There's um, bay, bay windows. Oftentimes there would be a, um, a hood or crown over windows. Um, these are all uh, details that, that you would find on an Italianate building. So the Victorian period, um, like the colonial and the romantic, um, there is no Victorian style of architecture. The Victorian period was named after Britain's Queen Victoria, whose reign lasted from 1837 to 1901. And in American architecture, the styles that were popular during the last decades of her reign are generally referred to as Victorian. But again, it's really these various styles that were popular within the Victorian period. Um, during this time frame, technological advances in construction, um, such as the introduction of balloon framing and moving away from timber framing, simplified the ability to build different forms um, from the traditional box-like um, shapes of architecture. So during this time, time frame, um, you'll, you'll start to see a lot of really complicated house shapes. Um, and, and a lot of um, decorative details that, that show up. There's um, a lot more flexibility in architecture, a lot more transitional architecture, taking features from one style and using it um, with others um, to build and design a, a house. Um, pattern books were a really um, big um, element during this time frame mail order house plans, um, these really expanded the range of styles and how they were um, dis and disseminating throughout New England um, and throughout the, uh, the whole country. People could really pick, pick and choose. Um, so here's, during this time frame, um, I'm just gonna point out, this is one example of how reading architectural style can help you um, understand a little bit about the history behind the, the buildings. So the, this concept of these pattern books um, is the dissemination of I ideas. People were able to, to see all of these different um, styles and, and, and patterns and, um, and incorporate them into their own um, architectural plans. But also you have the railroads, right? There, this is a time frame where the railroads are going through and um, and so you have the ability to disseminate ma materials. So in areas where you might not have been able to access some of the decorative uh, details, for example, um, of a Queen Anne house, um, they might have been able to arrive um, uh, by railroad. Also, the railroads coming through communities would um, infuse communities with a, 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 point, a period of pr prosperity. So you might see um, when the railroad came through, that would be a time in the community where you see um, styles um, uh, relative to, to that time frame, um, where just you know people had a lot of money and they were building. Um, they, there was a building boom um, in in the community. Um, there may not even have been new buildings. Um, you might actually see an older building, say a Georgian building which has perhaps um, you know, Queen Anne elements applied to it, that might clue you in to something happened during that Queen Anne phase um, regarding the prosperity of that a homeowner or that, or that community. So it's just sort of a, a, a mention of, of that, you know, reading a, a building.
So the first um, style that, that we'll look at here is the Second Empire. Uh, it was certainly considered very modern at that time and imitated the latest in French building fashions. And um, the, the key feature of the Second Empire, uh, the recognizable feature, you might say, is the mansard roof. Um, and that's the dual pitched roof. And um, it would have dormer windows on steep lower slope. And it was particularly practi practical because you could have a full living story within your attic space. Um, so, um, and then there, of course, there were other um, features that you might see on a second empire house as well, but it's always the, the mansard roof that really clues you in to, to that particular style. The stick style uh, is actually um, transitional between Gothic Revival and Queen Anne. And um, there's an emphasis on using the wall surface as a decorative element. Um, and this was also a style that was particularly popular in pattern books. Um, you might have horizontal or vertical cladding um, with this, um, the diagonal stick work. Um, and it was um, key elements would certainly be the um, prominence of, of the wooden elements. And um, this is the, the first um, style that we'll talk about using the, the, the stick uh, the stick work. And I always, um, you know, as I'm wandering around, I always think of sort of decorating with popsicle sticks. Um, so it's, it's this, this type of, of, of detail on different styles as we see over time. Um, and this, as I said, it's, um, you know, uh, that transitional between Gothic revival. Here you have um, the Gothic, the, the Gothic um, type of, of door there, the pointed arch. So Queen Anne, Queen Anne is a style um, unto itself, but there are actually multiple variants within Queen Anne. Um, and the style was uh, named and popularized by a group of 19th century English architects. But um, the, of course, the name has little to do with Queen Anne um, or the Renaissance architecture that was dominant within her reign at the early uh, 18th century. But this is the Queen Anne style. Uh, it's a very decorative, detailed um, architectural style, really made use of the um, technological advances to have very complex roof lines. You might have rounded towers, um, a lot of uh, you know, pro pro projections, bay windows. And um, some of the elements that you might see to help differentiate the different variants um, the most popular, the most recognizable is probably the spindle work um, uh, variant. And um, the spindle work, these, you know, delicate turned posts, um, lacy um, elements uh, in, in the, the wall feet, feet features, gable ends, that, that sort of thing. Um, this particular example that you see here is actually a free classic variant. And um, the free classic variant would basically make use of classic elements. So um, things like the, the more uh, the classical um, porch columns, um, the, uh, the uh, which, uh, P P Palladian windows, um, you might have, have that on a free classic and uh, cornice de details would all show up on a free classic variant of a Queen Anne. Um, two other Queen Anne variants, you have pattern masonry, which is um, pretty much self-explanatory. Um, and then you have the half timbered. And um, that again um, is uh, essentially, it's using the stick work. Um, it's still using wood, um, but it's, it's the decoration of the, that, that popsicle stick or the, the stick work um, elements that make it um, a Queen Anne uh, half timbered variant. But as I said, it's a very, very decorative um, type of, of architecture. The shingle style, um, this, uh, is, this house here is actually a women's club in Concord. And this is a transitional um, 
architectural a traditional example between Queen Anne and shingle. So you'll see some um, Queen Anne form in this house, but you'll you'll see the particular element of what makes a shingle style house, and that is the use of um, the wood shingles um, as the uh, the decorative element. Um, usually, it's a, you know would be a complex shape with a very smooth shingled surface. That's pretty much the, the cladding. I mean, there uh, would de define that architectural style. You would also see um, shingle style houses that are a little bit later. Most of the time, these are um, architect de de designed um, houses or larger houses. Um, uh, not shingle style wasn't as, as much used um, by the, the masses. So the next period um, we're going to look at here is the eclectic period. And these are buildings that drew upon all of the preceding styles for in inspiration. Um, the early examples were often more uh, tra tra transitional e e examples of architecture during the middle period of this time frame. Um, the the accuracy of the representation of those traditional style styles went up so they were much more um, accurate in terms of copying the earlier periods um, and as we get into the later end of the period we start to see influences of technological advances and just the dissemination of the architectural styles and as they were adjusted for the the masses um, the bungalow craftsman is, um, is actually an early um, example of the modern movement, um, but it falls within this period. So colonial re revival, um, these are houses that would have referred back to the Georgian federal um, style of, of houses. Um, and as I said, depending on when they were built, they might have um, features that would not have shown up in the original um, it, it, it examples, but were very common in the colonial revival period. And that um, can really help you um, see or, or clue, clue you in as to whether this is a early example or a later um, a, a example. The Dutch colonial revival is essentially a subset of the colonial revival style, and um, it's set apart by the gamble roof. And um, I will mention that uh, very few examples of colonial revival or Dutch colonial re revival actually reflect original uh, Dutch architectural um, uh, precedents. Tudor revival. Um, this actually mimics late medieval English prototypes rather than the architectural characteristics of early 16th century Tudor England. Um, but what makes the American version similar is the emphasis on these steeply pitched roofs and ornamental half timbering. So here's another example of stick work. Um, but what makes this a little bit different than previous examples of stick work is the use of um, either masonry or, or uh, the, the veneer and, and stucco. So previous examples of stick work were pretty much all wood. And here you have the use of the um, various ma ma materials. So the bungalow craftsman was actually um, inspired primarily by the work of two California brothers, uh, Charles Sumner Green and, and Henry Mather Green, uh, who practiced in Pasadena from 1893 to 1914. And they drew upon influences from the English arts and crafts movement. Um, and this style became particularly popular through pattern books, through magazines, um, Often there were pre-cut packages from various companies uh, that would that that people every everyday people could could use um, to build their houses um, using local lumber or again lumber um, you know packaged um, sets that were brought to them um, and uh, this particular style 
goes away from all of the decorative detail of some of the earlier um, styles that we were just looking at, really get, gets down to craft, craftsmanship. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, there's certainly larger examples of, of the craftsman architecture, um, but it was um, certainly uh, very relevant to small scale um, uh, housing. So now we're going to move into the mid-century modern period. And um, this particular period, uh, you know, post-World War II, there was a shift in taste and style um, from those uh, traditional period houses to very much a new modern style. Um, and these styles uh, grew in popularity. Um, they sometimes echoed details from preceding styles, but they were very innovative in shape and form. And they were definitely influenced by how they fit on the landscape and the um, neighborhoods and communities that they were built in. And this is um, another example of how to read history from style. So the form and layout of these particular houses reflect how uh, families were living in, in their dwellings. Um, and we'll, we'll see that as we, as we work our way through. Um, but you can definitely read how um, you know, people were, were living, how they were existing in their communities through the architecture. So this first, um, the ranch, um, this is uh, typically was a small house, but it could have been a larger house, um, but uh, definitely reflective of uh, the um, growing out into the post World War II suburbs, you have larger, um, larger suburban plots that these could be placed on. Um, and they were typically one story, uh, low pitched gable or hipped roofs, very limited detailing really um, uh, very much attractive to all of the folks coming back from World War II and setting up um, households with their, their families. Um, we certainly know all about the post-World War II um, neighborhoods. One of the, the key things um, about this architectural style that is certainly different from previous ones is how often um, the in a garage or a carport was incorporated within the structure of the house. Um, so as you wander around, um, you might see a number of these, you know, certainly carports uh, and enclosed to expand living space, um, but you can usually still recognize them as, um, as original carports. And this really uh, re re reflects um, the, um, the shift to automobile living, um, the dependence on, on cars, um, and a change in how people related to their, um, to, to their communities. So this is another post-World War II architectural style, the split entry or raised ranch. It's similar to the ranch, um, but it provided additional living space. So the split entry um, is actually, uh, you go in and uh, immediately you either walk upstairs to the, you know, to a main um, living, living area with um, bedrooms, living spaces, or you immediately walk downstairs into um, additional living spaces, perhaps den, additional bedrooms, um, garage, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, so it, it was really reflective of how people wanted to be functioning within their, their houses. The split level um, is actually a little bit different from the split entry. Uh, this is actually the style of house that I grew, grew, grew up in. Um, and this was um, essentially multiple different levels that you would access from stairs within the, the house, not immediately as you walk in. And the intent was to separate living um, activities. So you, your main level would be things like your, your active um, uh, public spaces, your kitchen, your living room, your dining room. Sleeping spaces would be on your, your upper story. Um, and then downstairs, you might have um, a den or a family room, a playroom, that, that kind of thing. Sometimes 
noticed um, that you don't actually have too many details to work with in terms of um, style. Um, so you might be, be looking at building form and plan to help you um, gauge some, some clues as to when a building was built. Uh, sometimes um, the building forms and plans might have architectural features appended to it. Um, but we'll, we'll go through some of, of, of these. Um, it's not so much style, but, but form. So here um, you have the center hall plan. Um, and again, um, obviously, if you walk into the building, these, these plans become very obvious. But oftentimes, you, you, can, you can tell what the plan is on the interior from the exterior. So you've got the center hall with the center entrance. You have the side hall with the side uh, and, and entry there. And then of course you have the very common cape. Another form that you would find in New England and New Hampshire um, would be the connected farmhouse. Um, and uh, essentially, you have the uh, uh, main living activities in uh, the big house. You early on, you would have the, the kitchen um, in the little house. Um, perhaps that would become a, 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 an L, a living space. Um, the back house would be, you know, work workspace, uh, work workshop, perhaps. And or a carriage house, and then of course you have the, the barn. All of the roof lines would be um, parallel to one another, um, and this is another uh, very quintessential New England, New Hampshire um, house uh, plan form. Laura, just a, a five minute, little less than five minute warning. Yep, I'll do okay. it. Thank you. Great. Um, so uh, some of, some other form um, and plans here uh, where are these um, multi-family houses. So you might find these in New Hampshire's uh, cities or larger towns. You have duplexes, which might be divided um, horizontally or vertically. And then of course you have the triple deckers. Um, and uh, again, um, this is another example of, of reading the building, right? So you read the building and it clues you in to um, perhaps what is going on historically in the, the community. So triple deckers were often um, the first um, sort of uh, hook into home ownership and property ownership for immigrant families. Um, you might have a multi-generational um, occupation or they might use one of the, the stories as a rental space to help pay off the, the building. Um, so these are just different forms of architecture that, um, that tell you a little bit about, um, about about the area. Um, and oftentimes these would have been wor worker housing. Again, sort of your mill communities, your industrial areas. And these last two um, forms are the cottage plan and the cottage plan uh, really, you know, one story small houses could be very varied in roof lines, minimal architectural details. Um, very common uh, type around the turn of the 20th century and then into the 1950s. And then a little bit bigger style, this is the, or form, this is the four square, um, two, two and a half stories, uh, very square boxy um, architectural um, uh, form. And oftentimes it was prefabricated and sold through catalogs. So, um, so that's, uh, there are definitely more styles, more forms that you might en 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 encounter throughout New Hampshire um, that I didn't go through in this short overview. Um, but uh, here are some resources that, that you can use to research a little bit about um, specific uh, examples of, of architecture in New Hampshire. Uh, Emmett, if um, people aren't familiar, is our um, new-ish, but it's been around a little bit now, um, our di digitization of the DHR uh, um, town files, all of our property files. There's certainly um, the Field Guide to American Houses by M M McAllister. This is the Bible of um, folks who wander around streets looking at architecture. 
Um, Jim Garvin's Building History of Northern New England is an excellent um, source for understanding architecture and particularly construction methods, which I really didn't go into at all here. And then of course, um, Bryant Hall's um, New Hampshire Ar Ar Architecture Guide. Um, so as, as you can see, um, as I mentioned earlier, there, are, you know, you, you, you read a building, um, or you can read, read a building and garner from that building um, similar types of understanding of history and of community, of family, um, of historical trends that, that you might um, use uh, from the resources in a library or, or an archive. Um, these are, um, you know, the, the, the buildings, the landscapes, the things that, that people leave be, be behind often have as much to tell us about, um, about our history as those um, archival uh, resources. And I just wanted to leave you with that, hopefully with a little bit of curiosity of what you see around. And then perhaps even thinking about how current architectural styles and ma materials that are popular today might tell future generations about us. So thank you very much. Um, be happy to answer any questions. Laura, thank you so much. That was fabulous. And I had listened to this, a similar presentation last summer that um, Nadine had given, and there was so much more additional information in this. So really nice job. Um, we have not had anybody put any questions in. So I please encourage people to do that. Um, Cause Laura's here to answer questions. I have a couple that I will start with. One is you mentioned pattern books. Do you have, for those who would like to do further research on their house or houses in their neighborhood, do you have any recommended pattern books? Um, well, certainly the, the pattern books that were done by, um, by Downing and, and Davis, um, I believe that you can, you can find um, uh, you know, th those around in various places. Um, I know that when I was working on my master's thesis, I found copies of them, whether they were, um, you know, in, in libraries or um, re re reproductions of original ones. Um, certainly, um, things like uh, Sears and M Montgomery Ward and um, a variety of those um, uh, manufacturers, the stores, um, they, they had pat tons of patterns and, um, and there's resources available to look at those. Um, let's see. Well, that's a good start. Anyway. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, I can certainly, you know, I, I think we can do a little bit of research and come okay. up with a few others. Um, I'll be sending yeah. a follow-up email tomorrow and I'll put some of these names in that email for folks. Okay. Um, Okay, a few questions came in. What is the Italianate building in Chester? I think you had an image of. Um, so I don't know um, all of the, I don't know the names of all of the photos that are in the PowerPoint. Um, full d d disclosure, I didn't actually create the PowerPoint. Um, so there were a number of, of buildings that I recognized, um, but, um, but I'm not sure offhand. Okay, no problem. And here's, let's see, someone who's joining from upstate New York. That's wonderful, welcome. Do you have, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Lustron houses in New Hampshire? Oh, um, gosh, I, I know what I know what, what what they're talking about. Um, and that is another good question that I will follow up on. Um, I don't remember um, talking about those offhand within within New Hampshire. Um, they definitely come up in conversation, but I'm not sure what the context was. So I will I will find out for those of us who, who do not know what they are. It's the type of con construction, it's a tw 20th century um, ar architecture ma ma material. Okay, great. Uh, links to information. Oh, here's some, Linda Wilson says there's a Lowestrand house in New Hampshire on Route 4 East. Ah. Uh, 
but then she says i think it was demolished that's it. oh sorry <laughs> thank you linda <laughs> um and i, I just Beverly, I would say that please, if um, there's probably folks in the audience who might be able to answer some of these questions. So um, feel free if you have the answer to share. To please, unmute. Please, please do. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you have something to add to that. John, all surfaces are enameled like your stove, it says. Yeah, I, I just unmuted myself. I'm the person that wrote that. And when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, a Lustran house was built as a model in, in my hometown, Battle Creek, Michigan. And I really wanted my parents to buy it. Uh, uh, but even the, all the inner, inner wall surfaces were enameled. I mean, you can imagine it would get rusty and crappy over time, but it was it really impressed me as a kid. Interesting, great. Um, any other questions? I just have one comment when, um, Laura, you had talked about homeowners sort of modernizing their houses, maybe even in the Victorian period and not necessarily building it new Victorian, but modernizing an old. And we have a perfect example of that in my town where there is a home that was built, I think in the late 1700s and then in the late 1800s or 30, 1870s or so, I don't know when exactly, they Victorianized it and changed it so much you would not have known what was underneath. And then sometime after that, 50 years after, they brought it back to the original look. And when you show people this picture of the Victorianized house, they don't believe you that it was this house, but indeed <laughs> it was. It was such a change with dormers added and porches and everything. And then it got stripped back to its original late 1700s form. Yeah, yeah no, that, that, that's a great uh, example. And one of the things that that you might be able to use to to say, oh, yeah, this this was not built at this time. It was built earlier. Perhaps if you did have access to the interior was looking at the timber framing versus yeah. the framing of a later um, style. Um, but but that that would clue you in. Something happened at that property in that community in that later time period in the 1870s that inf you know that that had there was an influx of of money and and a reason to upgrade and to make things modern and and then of course 50 years later it was a similar styles change they had the money to to to, to change along with it yeah i think for this particular house it was a change of ownership it was a new owner that came and did a big yeah. change there was a, a similar example with different circumstances here in Danbury. The original town center was several miles north or west of where the town center is now. When the railroad came through in the 1840s, the town center moved, including the church, to where it is now. But that wasn't the only thing that moved because there were a lot of houses in the way of the railroad and other buildings, and they were moved and cobbled on to houses that were already existing. And we know this for a fact because my sister's house, an early Greek revival, has an older building, which was probably a workshop or a shed hitched on to the back with earlier construction. But you can tell because its roof is lapped onto the Greek revival roof. Otherwise, we might have assumed it was an earlier cottage that grew. Interesting. Thank you, Linda. Um, and thank you, Karen, for this comment. Look at Sanborn insurance maps. Laura, can you comment on the insurance maps, please? Sure. Um, so the Sanborn company um, uh, basically created all of these maps for the purpose of fire in insurance. And uh, mostly you'll find them for, uh, for urban areas where fire um, hazards were, were greater. Um, but even in, in smaller urban areas, smaller towns, you might be able to find Sanborn maps. And they really range from the um, 19th century into the 20th century. And they are just a wealth of information about buildings. Um, they can tell you um, uh, how tall they were at different times, if there were porches, 
um, uh, the types of heating, um, you know, in, in a building, particularly for industrial sites. There might even be um, notes, uh, you know, that, that there's a night watchman there. Um, uh, so you, you can definitely, you can follow through the, the various Sanborn maps um, to, to, to watch the evolution of a building. Oh, it went from two stories to three stories, or you know, or the opposite way, or it had a two-story porch um, where it used to have a one-story porch, um, or now it has a tower, and before it didn't have a tower. Um, all of those those types of, of details. A lot of them are color coded, um, but there are also versions that are not color coded, and they they're keyed in different ways. Um, and you can access them in a variety of ways. Um, it's been a little while since I've access, accessed them here in New Hampshire. I think it was through Dartmouth, but I might be mi mistaken. But but there are they are uh, accessible and they're they're really great. And I have to point out, we do have a house histories program coming up July 13th with Andrew Cushing and Mae Williams. And I think Andrew's on the call today um, talking about how to research your house, home's history. And they do talk about Sanborn maps. Um, so stay tuned for that. OK, here's another question. Did federal style houses usually have the same arrangement of window on the back of the house as the front? Five windows across the top with four windows and a center door on the lower level. That's a good question. I, I would not have an authoritative answer on that. Okay, we'll have to read one of the books, I right? I'll Laura? do that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oftentimes the, the rear of buildings would be different from the front, um, but, but I, but I don't, don't know a specific answer for that, so. And especially if they happen to have an L off the back or something yeah. that would affect. Okay, any other questions? And feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna just chime in. Carl's talking, I think, but I, you're muted, Carl. You're still muted. There we go. Okay. Yep. Um, and my question is, when did sheet metal roofing come into general use in New Hampshire? And I'm thinking not only of barns, but in particular of, of barns. These are all really good specific questions that I am going to look into <laughs> and um, see if I can get some answers for Beverly as she sends out her email. Um, I don't know it, it, it exactly. Um, there is a wonderful book. Um, I don't know if, it, if this would be considered part of it, but um, a number of years ago, it was basically um, 20th century building materials. And um, when all of those, those building ma materials came into use. Um, and so that answer is probably in that book somewhere. And I will, um, I, I will get Beverly the name of, of that of that book. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to do my wrap up comments now. Um, and then, as I said, Laura's willing to stay on for another 15 minutes or so if you'd like to stay on um, after I do the wrap up. And I just remind everybody stay on until we choose the door prize winner, which we will do in about one minute. But I just wanted to thank Laura very, very much for this wonderful presentation, Laura. It was really great. Oh, thank um, you. We're so fortunate in New Hampshire to have this range of architectural styles dating back, as you had mentioned, to the 17th century, um, which is interesting because I was actually on a Zoom call with uh, Michigan someplace out in the Midwest, and they were talking about their old houses. And their old houses were not old in our terms. <laughs> um, so we hope you can use today's information as you walk around your communities and look at your historic buildings and have a new sense of architectural styles and their features and look at those brackets on the Italianate houses and all those wonderful things and make use of your community's walking tour if they have one or a neighboring community. And also we have an incredible number of historic house museums in New Hampshire that I encourage you to participate, to go on a tour 
and get to see the inside of these amazing houses. Um, we love getting like-minded folks together for programs like this to share information, make connections and offer a dose of energy and inspiration too. Thoughtful and experienced presenters like Laura and your, your great questions and involvement make a huge impact on advancing preservation interest and efforts across New Hampshire. We want you to know the Alliance is here and encourage you to check out our website um, for all kinds of wonderful resource information at nhpreservation.org or send me an email anytime at bt at nhpreservation.org. Our next expo session will be next Tuesday at five with Steve Bedard, Bedard Preservation and Restoration, presenting Assessing Your Historic House Before Work Begins. But it's a great talk, um, even if you don't have any major project planned, um, he covers great uh, maintenance items for any old house owner. So I encourage you to check that one out. Um, again, visit our website for the full list of all the expo events um, and to register. I'd also encourage you to check out our expo guide of the 50 products and service providers on the expo page of the website. Okay, and for those who have been to our in-person expo in the past, um, you know we love to give outdoor prizes as our appreciation of your involvement with us. Um, so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Maggie Steer, to announce the lucky winner of Bryant Toll's New Hampshire Architecture and Illustrated Guide. It's a great resource to have in your car as you're traveling around the state, admiring our amazing architecture. So Maggie, who is the lucky winner? So a copy of this book, uh, Laura showed it in her slideshow um, with a different cover. Um, our lucky winner is Robert Pasco of Concord, New Hampshire. Is Robert Rob still on? Feel free to unmute yourself, Robert, if you're still here. Yes, Rob Bar this is Barbara Pasco. Robert's in the oh. kitchen. Oh, good. <laughs> Great. You can speak on his behalf, Barbara. <laughs> oh, no, he wants a book. Oh, boy. Oh, here's your book. <laughs> What's it called? Um, it's called New Hampshire Architecture, an Illustrated Guide. And it's arranged by county and town and includes all the important buildings in the state. Sounds like a historical romance. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really a wonderful guidebook. It's like a field guide to um, great buildings in New Hampshire. Oh, and so we love to explore. That's perfect. Yeah. Great. So we will, I will connect with you on how to get it to you, okay? okay. Yeah, I'll stay on. Okay, thanks for joining. You're welcome. Oh, thank All you. right, so please watch for follow-up email. I'll present. I'll be sending out an email um, probably tomorrow with links and additional resources and a recording of today's session, if you'd like to share that with folks, and a short survey to help us plan uh, future programs. Uh, and please help keep the Preservation Alliance vibrant by making a donation or considering a gift membership. Thanks again to Laura for her amazing presentation and for our partners at DHR. To our Old House and Barn Expo on the Road sponsors who are listed here on the slide. And to all of you who are supporters of our critical work that helps to advance efforts to save and steward special places around New Hampshire. We wish you well and look forward to seeing you at future Alliance programs. Um, so for those who would like to stay on, we welcome you to stay on for another 15 minutes or so of discussion. Um, otherwise, enjoy your beautiful afternoon. Thanks so much for joining. And Laura, you can stop sharing. Great, thanks. All right. So at this point, I think our numbers are down a little bit. So if people would like to unmute themselves and share a comment, ask a question. Um, I have a question. Great. Um, and it's about the cape. Was the cape form pretty much used continuously throughout our history? Yeah, it's it's pretty um, pretty standard. Um, it's you know it certainly with with the early early examples of it um, here. But where where I grew up in on Long Island in New New, New York, I I thought of the cape as a post World War War II style. And yeah. <laughs> so like, like a lot of these other, you know, like the small ranch in those housing developments, in my mind, oh, it was all these little cookie cutter capes. 
Um, so it's it's definitely a form that that carries over. I mean, I think in a lot of re, re respects, it's a great size for for um, you know starter houses, um, certainly. Um, but it's it's just a, a, a good form. And are there ways to date it uh, by just looking at the exterior because they do tend to be kind of plain? What are your tips about dating capes? Uh, well, sometimes capes as a form would have the application of elements from architectural styles on it. So, you know, it's, it's not always a perfect science because as we've talked about earlier, you know, you may have had um, sort of uh, an evolution of things being applied to, or, you know, other, other you know, the, the, the form, the, the building originally. Um, but you might have, say, you know, a cape with Greek re revival details on it. And um, perhaps with a little bit of extra research, you can put those clues together and say, oh yeah, this was built during the Greek revival period, that, during that, that time frame. Um, so those, those types of things. And but windows too, probably, right? You know, a, a shingle style cape, but you know, other styles certainly play, play into the, the cape form. <laughs> and possibly the size of the windows as well, right? Help you date the cape. The older capes have smaller windows, right? And bigger chimneys. Yeah, do the, I haven't even really thought about this. Do the modern capes, what do they do with their chimneys? Is it still a center chimney? Um, now I'm just seeing, talking from a personal perspective, but um, the, the capes that I'm familiar with, like modern capes um, that I'm thinking of, um, this just a uh, you know exterior chimney on the side of the building. Okay. Um, certainly, you know the the interior would have, would be a bit different than the original um, than the original floor floor plan. So if they move that chimney to the exterior wall, that frees up a lot of space inside mm -hmm. the block main block of the house. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Interesting. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Favorite architectural books? Um, I really like, we live in a connected farmhouse. So I really like big house, little house, back house, mm -hmm. barn. And uh, we moved from Massachusetts where we had a um, mid-century modern bungalow. <laughs> and so this was our first uh, farmhouse. And one of the preservation contractors was the one, uh, Jeb Heaney, he's up in Vermont now, but he recommended the book. And apparently there was a nursery rhyme that kids used to sing. I haven't been able to find it that, that has a tune that goes with yeah. the big house, house, back house barn. And it's so interesting when Laura was talking about the parallel roof lines, because uh, I'd never actually thought of that. There's a few in our, we live in the south end of Concord and they, it's true, no matter what size the house is, you know, the footprint is the same. And ours is probably a medium sized one. We have neighbors who have a, an enormous one. And, uh, but the, they're all the same, you know, every single one of them. And on one side of the house, it looks like a normal house. However, if you go to the west side, you can literally see where every connection is. So we have a big house, a little house, a back house, a barn. And then we have, actually I'm in the barn. I'm upstairs in the hayloft, which is our family room. And then we have a second barn. We have a little tractor barn that's been attached even to this barn. And when we bought the house, you could go from the front of the front door to the back of the second barn without ever going outside. We've closed that one door off now, but, um, and, and that's then probably 200 feet or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So the the debate has always been: Did they do it? You know, at West, you never see a connected farmhouse. You see them in, you see the a few in Maine. You see them in Massachusetts and Connecticut. They're very New England. And the theory was that the research I've done was that they didn't put them out west because there was a fear that if there was a fire in the barn from the animals that the dwelling would burn and if there was vice versa. However, that there has been no more evidence that that happened with a connected house versus with a separate house. And that's why the pattern didn't take on in the rest of the country. Other people have told me, oh no, that's just a pile of bunk. It's because Yankee farmers were very 
frugal with with trying to keep themselves warm and they just didn't want to go outside <laughs> they well, wanted yeah if you read tom hubka's book yeah he says that is not the reason you know the, the yankee farmer staying warm it's yep. the little micro industries on a farm that were performed in each of these little spaces within these buildings yeah and tom hopka actually does do um presentations around new hampshire and maine in the summer usually because he comes to maine and i think it's western part of maine for the summer i don't i haven't heard if he'll be around this summer but it's a great presentation i think you'd be very interested in it barbara oh, I see it. when we first moved here our youngest daughter was a teenager and she uh I remember because I think there's five five staircases, maybe six between all the buildings, and she was trying to find her bedroom and she burst into tears. <laughs> this little staircase goes into the kitchen. And she's like, I can't find my bed. It was so funny. Why did you buy this crazy house? And now it just seems so intuitive. All right. Thank you for your comments, Barbara. Anybody else before we close for today? No. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining. And thanks again, Laura. Um, it was wonderful much. to have you. Really great. Um, and get out and enjoy this afternoon, everyone. And again, happy National Preservation Month. Bye-bye. <laughs>